My name is Chris Lurson. I'm the, the marketing manager within our, our, our tillage product line here at Case IH. He says that I farm, and, which is true, up in northeast Iowa. It's, uh, it's another state just kind of to the west for you guys that aren't familiar with a, a map. Uh, two, two doctors of, uh, of, uh, from, from the University of Illinois, I'll let them introduce themselves here. Yes, I'm Allison Vogel, and I am the, the new tillage research agronomist here with Case. And I actually just finished my doctorate in May with Dr. Velo. So. And I'm Dr. Fred Velo. I'm at uh, University of Illinois, crop physiologist. Yeah, great. It's, uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite a pleasure to, to share a stage with, with folks that have a doctorate degree, because I do not. I, I just farm. So I, I look to these folks for, for advice and, uh, and, and help a lot. So we really appreciate them. So um, what we want to talk to you about today is a, a really a hard matter. <laughs> but I'm, compaction uh, is what we're really going to get at today. And anybody remember what your, your conditions were like this last spring? Maybe you've already tried to forget them. Last fall, man, it was, it was a pretty tough situation for most of us in this field. You know, you, you see some water standing anywhere. You see any, uh, hey, that happens to be me up there. You get, you get stuck anywhere. That's a that's our magnum and planter up in northeast Iowa. We, we got stuck 10 times, 10 times this year trying to get our crop in. And, uh, oh, that was last fall. Anybody have wet conditions last fall? That's our grain cart uh, just up the road from where I live. Uh, buried that thing, and a couple hours later, we were combining again. But what are the results from that? And, and, and what, uh, what effects are, are we going to have and, and see? And, and I'd like, you know, Allison and, and Dr. Vogel to help us understand what are we seeing in the fields, you know, today? And, and what should we be thinking about this fall? So, um, Chris, I know all about compaction because I, uh, I custom farm. And, and that means when my operator, if his ground is too, too wet to harvest, he can come over and harvest mine. And so I, 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 I'm very familiar with compaction. I mean, not only did we have a lot of compaction last fall, we didn't get a chance to correct it. And then we turned off wet uh, and wet in this spring and I, I can't tell you. I, I could tell where the grain cart was on every row. Yeah. I could tell where the tractor turned on the head rows. So uh, it's a, you know, we're going to see some pictures, not unlike this. And it was a pretty right. big problem this year. Yeah. And so this is what we were seeing. We had wet spots in the field. And when these weren't there, they were very small windows. And so farmers were, were going into situations that were less than ideal. And that's where we were seeing all that, that compaction issues occurring now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of issues that we created uh, that Mother Nature's, Nature helped us with. So what are we seeing today? What, what, are, what, are we, what do we think the fields might be like right now as we stand here? Yeah, so I, I took this picture, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to admit this might be my farm, but, uh, um, you, you know, uh, you, you can see the head rows. You can see where every line in the compaction, uh, compaction occurs. You know, it was, uh, this crop was planted in June. And as Allison mentioned, it was uh, we needed to get that crop in. It, it might have been dry enough on top, but it certainly wasn't under underneath. And so uh, you know, we get we see it. You don't have to drive very far to see a lot of uneven crop, yes. you know, particularly in the hedgerows. Yeah. But even out mm -hmm. in the middle of the crop, you get up and you look at this with a drone, and oh man, I could tell you every line where there was a where was a grain cart. Yeah, absolutely. And exactly like he's saying, there's just a lot of variability in the field, and we will be able to show you what that's going to be doing to your yield. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I don't know if anybody's been driving around, and I, I have the same syndrome, and maybe you do too, that you look at the side of the field as you drive by, it's that kind of 55 mile an hour shot, and it looks pretty good, but uh, when you get out into it, boy, it, it, there's a lot of differences out there and variability, as you mentioned, that's right. So, you know, what are, what are the, the causes maybe of what's happening here, and, and what, what's maybe things that we're not necessarily thinking about right now, Allison? Sure. This above ground, we're seeing this variability in stand, and a lot of that is coming from the compaction. And so that's coming from what's happening to the soil. So here we have a little demo uh, of what the soil um, is looking like when it gets compacted. So over here we've got your normal soil, and we have lots of pore space in there. And then what you're doing with compaction, you're applying that pressure, and you're actually um, changing your structure of your soil and removing that pore space. So you're removing 
um, areas for, for oxygen, for air, and for water to be in that soil. You're making the soil tighter, and so you're actually causing issues with, with water movement, um, air in there, and then also just having those pathways for your, for your roots to actually move easily through the soil. Yeah, and when you have something like this, it doesn't go away very easy. Think about how many wetting and drying or freezing and thawing cycles that it takes to get rid of that. And those freezing cycles have to be pretty deep. You know, I was, uh, I was looking at my field, uh, wetting and drying, I had a great big crack because of the dry conditions. And I was thinking, I, I hope that's gone through the compaction layer and is and helping solve that problem. Yeah, and, and you know, Allison, do you think you could maybe compare that to a brick? Yes, absolutely. So this would be an example of your compacted soil where you've actually pressed all those uh, soil particles together uh, and you don't have the pore space. And so if you were to pour water on this, it's going to actually be running off of it. It's not going to be percolating through it like we would want. And so um, your, your, your water flow, your nutrient flow is going to be an issue. Whereas when we use the sponge, which is more like your, your, hopefully your normal soil, your healthy soil, it's actually going to be allowing that soil to go through it and it's gonna be holding it in that pore space. Notice it doesn't flow through. Excellent. There we go. And then it's available to us when we need it, right? Yes. Get rid of that. Very good. Okay, so. And so there's some, some causes and, and what the soil might look like underneath. So what are, what are some of the, uh, the, the, the early season maybe uh, uh, effects, you know, mm -hmm. what, what are we seeing maybe right off the bat in the spring? What are, how could we have like, diagnosed this maybe mm -hmm. earlier? Sure, and um, I mentioned that we're making the, the soil tighter. And so because of that, we don't have as many areas for moisture, um, for water in there. And so when we actually plant our seed, there's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be sporadic where, where the water is actually available to that seedling. So germination is going to be variable just in the ground getting access to that moisture and actually germinating. And then the, the plant, this little seedling is gonna have to exert much more energy just to bust through that soil surface. So you end up with this variation um, in our, in our early, early season, right from the get-go, in the ground, the germination and then busting out of the soil surface, we get this uneven emergence. And we know that that has an effect. Yeah, you certainly didn't have to look very hard to find this this year, uneven, unevenness and emergence. And uh, uh, unevenness and emergence, uh, you know what that's going to do later. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So this, uh, this is something that we can visually see, right? I mean, we drove around. You might have seen this yourself. But, but what about the unforeseen parts of this? You know, what, what actually is happening to create maybe this situation and the first pictures that we saw of corn? Sure, as in below ground. There you go. My yes. favorite, below ground. Yeah. Below ground, yes. And so actually under the surface, so we actually are seeing some deficiencies on top and that's why we, we dug down in this field and we, we dug down to see the roots and you can actually see we have, because of that tighter soil, we have restricted root growth and you can actually see it curving in this picture because it's hit some compaction and it's actually trying to compensate. So it's wasting energy there um, with that. So if you look at this picture, this is the size of the seedling when the plant has come off the seed reserves. Here it's relying on that root to be able to take up mineral nutrients. And when that uh, root growth uh, can't happen, guess what? Those nutrients aren't available. And now you have a classic nutrient deficiency here. Can you spot the nutrient deficiency in this picture? Anybody know which nutrient deficiency this is? It's an immobile nutrient that the root has to come in contact with. That is classic phosphorus deficiency and a clear case uh, where compaction has limited the growth of the root. But also nutrients that are mobile can be affected because if water's not moving through that compacted layer to the root, you're also going to see deficiencies of nitrogen, sulfur, and some mobile nutrients as well. Yeah, that's great. So is that the purple yep. part of the leaf you're seeing there? All right, if not everybody's seeing phosphorus deficiency, yeah. that hard, is maybe exactly Maybe it's hard to right see, but it's that yeah. purple. In that's Fascinating, fascinating to, to see and identify it that early in the season. Um, okay, so what, what else do we have? What, what, what sort of research, do we have anything more on, on, on and, and what are the ending results maybe 
uh, of this. So I got a plant that's behind, you know, uh, uh, roots that are not penetrating, they're shallow. What, I mean, I have a pocketbook here. I'd like to put some cash into it. What, are, what, what actually is the part where the rubber meets the road here, Allison and Dr. Vogel? Yeah, so uh, uh, no plant left behind is my strategy. If you look at the, the, the picture in the upper right, see that guy, that plant that uh, is shorter? It came up two or three days after his neighbor, and it is behind. That is usually a plant that sits in a tire track, planted a little shallow, came up later, and guess what? That plant in the middle, that plant is never going to catch up to his neighbors. There's not a single thing you can do to, the, to that plant to make it catch up. I mean, you can try. You can go out in the field and you can hug it. I mean, you, you can <laughs> sing to it. You can sleep next to it. And I'll guarantee you that that plant will have a smaller ear than its neighbor. Absolutely. So we did not try that, but, <laughs> but um, these images over here are actually from the, some case plots. And early, as in around V5, V6, we staged the plant. Um, and so what you're looking at is if it was a, a leaf behind or if it was two leaves behind, and, and we pulled these ears. And this is actually showing you with one leaf behind, you're losing 50% of your yield. And then if you're farther than that, in a whole nother growth stage, you're losing even more. So it just shows you how important uh, uniformity is for, for your stand. I, I call that two leaf behind plant a weed. Absolutely, yeah, and it's it's taken same amount of nutrients if it uh, it has access at that point, right? All right. So, what what other research do we have? Kind of back this up, you know? What's uh, what what are things that you've you've seen maybe and done in your own fields, um, doctor? Yes, yeah, so I'll share with you a little research we did at the University of Illinois. A fairly extensive study. We wanted to know the impact that having a uh, plant row in a tire track would be. And so we did, a, we did a pretty extensive study in 2015 where we uh, compared rows that were not in a tire track uh, and rows that were in a tire track. And, and by the way, that tire track was made by not, a, not some of the size tractors you see in here. This was a 150 horsepower tractor. And so we put it in the tire track and uh, right away we could see the result. I mean, even though they're labeled, I don't think I needed to put the label on there for you to know which one was in the tire track. We did this with both corn and soybean and we took it all the way to yield, again, a, a number of locations over the state, a whole bunch of different varieties, and uh, what I'm showing you here is the compacted, that's in the tire track, and the non-compacted and the impact on the final corn and soybean yield. Now, I know you're going to say 252 bushels in that compacted yeah. row is pretty good. What are we fussing about? <laughs> but if it wasn't compacted, notice we got another 33 bushels more. We did the same thing for soybean, almost 20 bushels out of the non-compacted row. So boy, that compaction really makes an impact on yield. And we brought a little demonstration here right out of our research plots to, to, to show you. 2015 was a fairly decent year. I'm guessing that the impact of compaction on yield is going to be a lot worse in a year like 2019. So what we're showing you here is various levels of compaction. See this, see this poor guy right here? <laughs> These were in the tire track. And then we have a different degree of distances away from the tire track. So this guy got pinched, not as bad as right in the row. Uh, this one was pinched a little bit more. See how they're getting better? But, uh, and then finally, we have the one that's not compacted. I mean, not only can you see the plants taller, better here, um, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to have a higher yield as well. So and you've got uh, I, the varying in the root sizes, the ear sizes, and then just the size of the plant with that vegetative uh, matter. Did you talk about soybeans? You talked about I soybeans did, briefly. I did. Soybeans right. also don't like their roots compacted as well. Even, maybe even worse because soybean hates to have its roots wet. Yeah. And we've seen that that compaction really holds that water around that root system. That's right. That's right. So. Some great data, some information there, and it really can affect us. And I would be happy with 250, but man, if somebody told me I had 280 out there and I didn't get it, I'd be pretty upset. So what are the things that I could do then to, to fix that and maybe get to that 280 or 70 bushel, 80 bushel beans? So <laughs> looking at different strategies, of course, the number one strategy is to stay off your field when it's wet. Yeah, right. Oh, come on, really? <laughs> I know, you guys. How can that be? I know, you know that. <laughs> Gotta get that crop in the ground. Yeah. But we completely understand that that's not always an option. And when you have those very small windows and you have to get out there, 
it, it may happen. But of course, that's number one. Try to stay off your field when it's not those ideal conditions. And then another one we have up here is that soil organic matter. Basically, try to maintain your soil organic matter because your, your soils that have it are gonna be more resistant and more resilient to compaction. So with that, you wanna make sure you're rotating your crops. You wanna make sure that you are uh, actually achieving fairly high yields because the higher yield you have, the more residue that's left out there at harvest. And so you're actually putting more organic matter just there on the surface. And so really important here is also just keeping um, the microbiology active as well. And so keeping everything moving along. Hey, and Elsa, that's, that's pretty time consuming, right? That's not something that, you know, six months from now I can you know, yeah. up my organic matter by 2% or anything, can I? Or? Very valid. Yeah. It takes a very long time. So that's why you want to try to maintain it. Another option, if you have the option, is to, to apply manure as well. That keeps everything extremely active. Ah, okay. And then the last one here, there's all different kinds of options, but when you do have that problem area where something got stuck in the field this fall, um, the, the easiest and the quickest option is is tillage. And we we, yeah. ha we can help you with that. Absolutely. Tillage. Yeah, so, tillage, yeah. yeah. Tillage. So <laughs> what, what about now, and, and maybe this, this is something, something more that we can help with, is I know that I've seen my crops like this, or maybe I haven't, but how do I know if I do have this compaction thing, right? What do, what do we got to do to find that? Sure. And you now we have a specific way and method of, of doing this that is very user friendly. It's very easy to do and doesn't require any special tools. Uh, it just requires just a little bit of sweat equity. And to, to find if I have compaction in my fields, it requires a spade, uh, a licensed operator, of said spade. Called a okay. grad student. Yeah, you guys have those readily available, <laughs> but, but somebody that is licensed that, uh, that can run one of these safely. Um, a pocket knife, which I have right here, and uh, a stick, a, a measuring stick. Uh, we call this a tiger stick. Very easy to do. And uh, in, in this particular picture, this is a, uh, a hole that I dug. Uh, anybody know the Hefty brothers up in Baltic, South Dakota? We did a field day with them a couple years ago, and I, I, I dug a hole just for fun. I do this a lot. You'll, you'll see me digging holes just to kind of see what's in the ground, see the roots, uh, and see what kind of moisture penetration we have. And I used my pocket knife and drug that pocket knife from the bottom of a five-gallon pail-sized hole, right? And you use that tip, just the tip of that. You drag it from the bottom up, and all of a sudden, you will run into something that probably feels a little bit like a brick, all right? Or it gets tougher. It's harder that way. Any idea where the bottom of that might be? If I measure down from the top, thoughts on, on where the bottom of that layer might be? What depth? What depth, yeah. Any guesses? Eight, eight, eight inches? Nine inches? Two inches? Normally, we find, and in all the holes we've dug across the country, I was in Ontario several weeks ago. I was in uh, Arkansas uh, a week ago. It's somewhere in that nine inch range. You will pretty much find it, all right? Maybe variable, I haven't been in everybody's field, but generally it's there. And that's where you find the bottom of the layer. That's the most important part of this. Now you can find the top too. And uh, do anybody see the top of the layer in that field? Do you see any sort of difference in that picture from the top down, from the surface down? Looks a little bit moist there, doesn't it? Looks wet. That's where the water perched and sat in that field in Baltic, South Dakota with the Hefty Brothers, okay? That's the top and it was about three inches down. So nine is about six inches thick, okay? So what do we do to remove that? Well, that's where the tiger point comes into play and, and some sort of mechanical removal. So we take the tiger point, which has a specific design of it, all right, in order to remove that and to fracture it. Now the key here isn't putting a stick of dynamite under the ground and exploding everything. We want to leave some structure, but we do want to crack and fracture it so that water and the roots can go down. Now we put that one inch under the compaction layer, which means if my layer is at nine, what am I putting it at? Ten. Ten. All right, you guys are good. Good job, Scott. Good job, Bob. Thank you, guys. You don't need that. All right, so we're at ten inches deep. How many people actually run their ripper at ten inches deep? Are, well done. Thank you. Thank you. Most are. Most of it's as deep as it will go, which is normally <laughs> like 16. A little deep. So we put that one inch under, 
and we allow that point to lift that layer, twist it, and roll it over. Okay, so we fracture that layer and create an environment that complements root growth, root penetration, nutrient availability, all right, and overall healthier crops. Okay, so we, we use all that to, uh, to really complement our, our crops. And, and obviously there are tools there that are available. The Ecolotiger 875 not only creates that compaction layer removal, as well as a flat surface out the back. Surface compaction, you know, the, the stuff that Allison talked about with poor emergence of crops, that tool is there for removal of surface compaction yeah, right. and, and helping that overall even emergence. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your time. Dr. Vogel, Allison, or Do Allison well, and Dr. Bilo, <laughs> excuse me. We appreciate it your time. It is Dr. Time. Vogel, too. It is Dr. Vogel, that's right. Yes. That's fantastic. So with that, thank you very much.